One of the things I've always wanted as a pastor is a, a church sign. You know, one of those church signs where you put witty sayings up? You ever seen one of those signs as you're driving by? Or do you just ignore it? Okay, I've always wished for one of those. Um, but we have uh, different priorities around one chapel, so um, we've, we, I've never, never had one of those. But I, I think church signs are funny because something gets lost in translation sometimes. Here's what I mean, check this out. Don't let your worries kill you, let the church help. <laughs> What, 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 what was the guy thinking when he was putting that up? It's like it was, he was too focused on what he was thinking, not on what that sign was saying. We love hurting people. That's, I, now, if I think about it, I know what they were trying to say, but it just didn't quite work. What's the next one? It's funny. Honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. <laughs> it's good. It's just, that's it. I, I appreciate that. That's it. making us feel safe. You know, it's really, really good for us to feel safe. Here's one. Whoever stole our AC units, keep one. It is hot where you're going. <laughs> most powerful use of a church sign to threaten people. It's nice, nice. Yeah, blah, 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 just come to church. <laughs> You guys like that one? Here's the problem. The signs, oh, here's one more. Do you know what hell is? Come hear our preacher. Oh my goodness. Something gets lost in the translation. You're driving by and you read it. So I think it's so important for us as God's people to make sure that we are not so myopic, not so fixated on what we know that we miss the big message that God's trying to give us, that God's trying to give the world. And I find that when people talk about the Holy Spirit, sometimes they use language that maybe the rest of the world doesn't get, or there's a, there's a, a sense of, uh, okay, I, 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 I know who the Father is, I know who the Son is, but the Holy Spirit, I'm not sure how this works. And so we've been in this series called Numa, and even the word Numa seems um, a little out of character. It's a Greek word, and so it it's, means, it, it comes from the Greek word for spirit, and it means breath or wind. Everybody say breath, say wind. And we get this from the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, who was a religious leader in the time of Jesus. In John 3, 6 through 8, he says, humans can reproduce only human life. This is Jesus talking. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. This is the deep work of the Holy Spirit when a person is made brand new on the inside. And there is something powerful that God does inside of a person and Jesus is explaining it to a religious leader who should have understood it but he couldn't. He was too stuck. He was trapped in his way of thinking. But there was a, there's a miracle that happens inside of a person when they are born again, they are born of the Spirit. Verse eight says the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. There is mystery to it, but I want us to enter into the mystery, and I want us to, uh, over this series, my goal has been to visit the different aspects of the Holy Spirit in very plain language. Because what happened, happens in us happened in the first human in Adam. Genesis 2, 7 says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now most people when they see that scripture they think that Jesus, God did CPR on Adam and suddenly he started breathing and that was it. That is not what happened there. What God was doing was making dirt into a living soul. And what he did was he's put the breath of life 
which means the spirit of life. And so he, he became a living being. And here's what you have to get. Humans were never meant to live without the spirit of life in them. Humans were never intended. God never intended for Adam and Eve or anybody who followed to live without the Holy Spirit inside them. But here we see it today. We see it all around us. People are walking around like dead people. They feel dead inside. They're doing anything they can to get themselves to feel alive. They're adventure seeking or they're drinking too much or they're partying all the time just to feel alive. People trying to figure out if drugs is the secret or sex or any number of things just want to feel alive inside. It's hard to feel alive when you're dead. And so God, his intention is that every human would carry his Holy Spirit that they would be born again. And today, I wanna talk to you about the idea of how you know if you are full of the Spirit of God. It's gonna be a really useful message because you're gonna be able to walk out of here today and you're gonna be able to evaluate yourself. Notice what I said. You're going to evaluate yourself, (laughs) not all the people around you. (laughs) We've had a couple of years of everybody fighting and evaluating everybody else all around us and fighting with each other. We are the people who love one another, and we are the people who are filled with the Spirit. And so I want to start out just by reading through a big passage. And I know it's uncomfortable sometimes when you read a a long passage. Sometimes you can get distracted. If you want to follow along on the message notes, it's going to be very confusing today because I'm skipping around a bunch of stuff. But, But you can read it on the screen. And here's what it says in the message version, which is a modern day translation of what Paul the Apostle was trying to convince a group of believers to live by the Spirit instead of living by the law. Living by the spirit, instead of being fixated on the flesh, our ability to obey the law, even, or the flesh, our freedom to just do whatever we want as we please. And so he's talking about this conflict that happens between flesh and between spirit. Between you and I walking around this planet doing whatever we want to or being led by the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. And so here's what he says. In verse 16, he says, my counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions That's a good word. Everybody say compulsions. The compulsions. People who live by the compulsions of their selfishness end up miserable. Now, it's true that at first they think that's freedom. I can do anything I want, anytime I want to. But you, most of you have lived enough life to know that if you live by the compulsions of your selfishness, you will end up in misery. You'll hurt people. You'll wound yourself, you will be isolated, you will end up alone because selfishness is driving everything you do. He says, he continues here, he says, for there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit. Just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical, there's a fun word to know and say, antithetical, they don't go together, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Ooh, Paul, easy, easy, man. I mean, I'm just doing my best trying to live here. Yes, he knows you're trying to do your best, so he wants to help you figure out how to be led by the Spirit so you won't ruin your life so that you won't hurt other people. So verse 19, it says, it's 
Uh, oops, sorry, no, I, I didn't get there. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? Ooh, I could speak like for five hours on that little sentence. And by the way, much of the New Testament is written on this subject. The entire book of Romans is this wrestling match between what is, what is the law uh, written for people and how the spirit actually supersedes the law. Galatians is another book that says, look, if you get fixated on the rules, you will eliminate the relationship. But if you get fixated on cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit, something happens. Your life begins to function not by the rules, but beyond the rules. You become led by God's Spirit, which means the law becomes no longer the driving force of your life. I meet so many Christians who end up becoming a Jesus follower, and then they kind of go through this thinking, well, you know what, I gotta, okay, I'm a Christian now, so I gotta do this, and I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I gotta, oh, gotta get rid of that, okay, oh, can't, can't do this anymore, I don't know. And then they just start living like that, trying to get rid of some things, trying to stop doing some things, and trying to be better at other things. I bet you've felt like that from time to time. Paul is articulating a better way. It is, it is the echoes of Jesus who in the Sermon on the Mount actually said things like this. He said, he said you have heard it was said, because he was talking to people who knew the law. Are you guys with me? Okay, you started really, really staring at me. Just wanted to make sure. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, for instance, he goes down a whole list. He says, you've heard it was said, don't murder someone, but I'm telling you, he's, he's like introducing a new idea. He said, I'm telling you, don't get angry at anyone. Because if you don't get angry, you won't murder. He said, if you have heard it was said, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, don't lust. You see here, you see here how the, the, the law of the spirit that Jesus was introducing, the way the kingdom of God works in a born again person changes their motivations so that the rules are easily obeyed. This is what the apostle Paul is talking about here. And he's talking about overcoming a law-dominated existence. Verse 19, it says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Pay attention, here it is. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Can I get an amen? Bunch of you got a bunch of mental and emotional garbage you're trying to get rid of, and you pay a therapist a lot of money to do it, to get rid of it. Listen, I believe in therapists. I believe people need somebody, sometimes who has tools because the abuse in their life is so bad. But I'm telling you, there is a helper. There is an advocate. There is a counselor that will help you in those therapy sessions if you'll let him. He says, <clears throat> here he says, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. You work against God's kingdom. And you might be sitting here today and you know, you're listening to that list and let's see, am I, do I get angry too much? Do I get drunk on the weekends too much? Am I like really just 
see everything as a competition between me and somebody else? Do I, do I just live out of comparison all the time? You realize, you realize that you need to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life in a greater measure, a greater way. So he makes this list, and he says, I could go on, I could talk about this. He says in verse 22, though, he says, but what happens when we live God's way? What happens when we are filled with the Spirit? He says he brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. This list is known as the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you can probably list it. Love, come on, can you do it with me? Love, joy, peace. Hey, if you can't do it, you're looking around at your neighbor. It's okay, it's fine. (laughs) Notice how I stopped on the fourth one because no one knows what the fourth one is. What is it? Okay, so you, ooh. (laughs) There's this list of all these ways of living, and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 23 says, legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting on our own, getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. I said it last week, I'm gonna say it again. Most of us are living between our ears instead of living from the source of life itself, the Spirit of God who lives in us. And you can ignore him or you can be attentive to him. You can have conversations with him or you can kind of figure it all out up here. Paul is talking about something that's so powerful here, and I want you to see what he's saying, the fruit of the Spirit. What exactly is that? All right, I'm gonna give you three ideas, right? The fruit of the Spirit is a result and not a practice. Most people think this is a good list. I need to put this list up on my mirror, and I really need to stop drinking so much. I need to I need to I need to have I need to stop having sex with everything that walks. This sorry, too brutal? Come on. You guys, this is real life. I, 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 most of you haven't been in my counseling offices, but you know, it's it's a deal. It's a thing. Our internal desires to have life on our terms is powerful. It's powerful. And here's the problem. You need a power that's greater than your own desire. And there's only one. There's only one. It's the Spirit of God. And he's so kind. He's so helpful. He's your advocate. He's not against you in any way. And we've talked about that in some of our our prior messages. Trying hard is how we see This list of the fruit of the Spirit, man, I need to love more. I need to be happier. I just need some joy. I need need to be patient, but I know I'm not, I'm never gonna pray for patience because I know what happens after that. (laughs) I I, 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 I need to be more faithful, more consistent. Oh, I I gotta get up in the morning. I'm part of a men's group at 6.30 a.m. on Friday morning. It's called Brotherhood. It's right back here on the wall. I lead it with Spiro Stavros. And I promise you, at 5.30 on Friday, I do not want to go. 
I want to stay in bed. But here's what's happened to me over years. I know that when I get up and go to that meeting with a bunch of men and we read the scripture and we pray, God does something beyond what I could ever do as a pastor. Beyond what I could ever make happen inside me. So I do it every Friday. And there's something about that consistency that has to do with the spirit of God inside me because I don't want to do it. Are you with me? It's a result, not a practice. Cultivating a deep in connection, deep connection and reliance on the Holy Spirit is the activation and fruit is the byproduct. That's what you gotta get. That's why we gotta remember, we're not doing something for God. We're doing something from God. Hey, that's good, that's tweetable right there. We're not doing something for God, we're doing something from God. We mistakenly believe that God is interested in our obedience. Well, Pastor Ross, isn't that why you preach? You were trying to get us to obey? No, actually, here's the crazy thing. Did you know that the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they obeyed better than most? Who was Jesus most mad at throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels? Who was he most mad at? The religious people. Because they were dead on the inside. They were dead on the inside and they relied on the rules and the obedience as their way to get to God. Jesus offers no such thing. I'm not saying he doesn't want you to obey, but the way you obey is really important. Obedience without love is legalism. It's all it is. You're just a mean old cuss <laughs> trying, to, trying to tell other people what they ought to do. Compliance without connection, compliance without connection is dead religion. Connection to God is where all this springs from. Obedience is simply the byproduct of surrendering to the Holy Spirit. Inviting him in to whatever you're facing, every circumstance, every issue, every conversation, every thought process, every, every moment of your day, you're inviting him in. That's why you, it's so good to start the day with him. Because you can begin to think about the day through the lens of what he thinks and what he wants to do. So you start cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit and something begins to happen. You, you begin to listen to the, this, this whisper that comes from his voice. You start to find ways that you quiet the outside noise and be attentive to the inside voice of his spirit. You embrace the practices and habits that he wants for you, things like the daily Bible reading. Have you ever heard of it? Listen, if you can't read the Bible more than 10 minutes every morning, that's cool. There's something called the daily Bible verse. And you could read that verse. And it starts you on a path. So it's not as if those aren't good things. Here's the, here's the danger, right? Are you guys still with me? Here's the danger. You can do the daily Bible reading out of dead religion if you want to. Or you can use it as a catalyst, a springboard to welcoming the Holy Spirit into your life to be led by him. Keeping in step with the Spirit means you start choosing things that produce fruit, right? You choose prayer instead of Netflix binging. I mean, I love some Netflix binging because there's just so much good stuff on Netflix. I mean, have you ever seen, I mean, so many good things that just make you feel uplifted, just bring joy into your life. It's so good. <laughs> I sound like, I, 
<laughs> I sound like I sound like the get off my lawn guy. Like Netflix, bad. No, look, there's some stuff on Netflix. You just got to be led by the Spirit to find it. <laughs> that was a joke. You, know. you end up loving the scriptures instead of your romance novels, as good as those are. You end up wanting to go to church. No, that can't happen, right? Do you want, does anybody want to go to church? <laughs> you want to go to church more than you want to go to the bar. Church should kind of be like the bar, right? Cheers, right? Where everybody knows your name. That's why we're in our name tags. And everybody's glad you came. Like that's what, I, I hope they don't put that on the internet. That's, that was awkward. Here it is, living in the spirit is not about do's and don'ts. It's about surrendering every step to him. That's what it is. Fruit of the spirit, number two. Fruit of the spirit is a process that takes time. Oh, bummer. I hate to tell you this, but fruit doesn't grow overnight. Remember when you were in school, I don't know if you guys did this, but you had a little styrofoam cup and you put a little seed in it, somewhere around third or fourth grade or something. You put a little, did anybody do that? Was I the only one? Yeah, okay. So you put a little seed and every day you're like watering it and then you're like, is, where is it? Where is it? Took a long time. Took like three days. <laughs> Do you want to know how impatient you and I are? We're, we've been trained by the addictions of our culture. You know, I can get, I am now not happy with next day delivery. <laughs> how did I get unhappy with next day delivery? Oh, I want today delivery. I want to order it and I want to see it on my front door in two hours. I meet Christians like this all the time. They want to speed everything up. They want to inject everything with some kind of weird growth hormone. You realize that's what happens in our food when we try to grow it too fast. It gets all kinds of gunk inside of it. And I, I think I see a lot of Christians who are, they seem spiritually mature on the outside, but inside they're emotionally immature because they haven't allowed, they've been, they've, been, they've been eating Christian fast food. They've been, they've been like, all they do is kind of, uh, <laughs> all they do is take in the tweets of famous preachers. That's what they live on. I love famous preachers. I'd like to be one one day, but hey, <laughs> you can't live on those tweets. You can't live on that. You've got to go deeper. There's got to be more time. The Holy Spirit's not into microwave Christianity. He's into crockpot Christianity. Let's all be crockpots. I didn't say crackpots. I said crockpots. The Apostle Paul makes life in the Spirit. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul makes life in the Spirit every believer's responsibility. How? Oh, so hard, so hard. Maybe I shouldn't tell you. It's been so encouraging up till now. Thanks for coming back, Owen. <laughs> Especially since you were on the front row and all, that was good. Okay, I'll tell you. Galatians 5.24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Crucifying your flesh sounds really painful, doesn't it? If just the word, like crucifixion. <laughs> like that's so painful. You think about Jesus. People think living for God is so hard. It's not. Living for God is actually easy. The hard part is crucifying yourself. The painful part is saying no to yourself. And that's why you need help to do it. 
That's why you need the Holy Spirit inside speaking his words of wisdom and life and giving you power that's beyond yourself. He's the one who helps you give somebody else a little grace when they're not measuring up. He's the one that keeps you from judgment and he's the one who helps you know that even when you fall, Jesus has already paid the price for you and you can just turn right back to him and he's there. It's a process and it takes time and there's no fast way to do it. I believe that everyone in our church needs to be in a small group of people that are helping each other, helping each other live this way. If you don't have that, you're not gonna make it. Every one of us needs a group of people that will say, it's okay, let me help you. It's okay, let me walk with you. Everybody needs a group of people that says, man, I, I really messed up this week. Will you guys help me? We need a way to practice the presence of God in our lives and being in communities. One of those that leads to the third point. The fruit of the Spirit is matured and measured by relationships. <laughs> What's that list? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, baby. You know all of our problems when we try to control other people, right? But self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. You are made to control this. And the Holy Spirit is the power behind that self-control. It's very hard to do it without. When we start to walk in the Spirit that brings freedom, here's what happens. When we start to walk in the Spirit that brings freedom to our lives, Love is the result. You love people better. You take care of others. Early on in Galatians, we didn't read it this morning, but it says the, 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 the way you fulfill the law is one command, one thing. If you'll just do it, you've covered all the law, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Holy Spirit power is what you need to do that. And that means that when you're part of a group, that annoying person in the group, isn't there always an annoying person? If you're like sitting here and you're like, no, you might be it, I don't know. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. That person that just gets under your skin a little bit, guess what, guess what? You know what God wants to do with you? He wants to work on you to love that person. Love somebody who's not like you. Love somebody who's just a mm, little, little different. Love coming out of you. But it's not just the annoying people that are useful to God. He wants you to have friends too that will encourage you along the way. But the Holy Spirit's in all that. The Holy Spirit's way of producing fruit and the way we measure fruit is found in the life of the Spirit. And so I want to pray with, for you today. And I want to pray, and I want to ask God. I want you to pray and ask God to fill you with his spirit. For most of you, most of you here, there was a time when you were born again. And he already lives in you. But you've allowed a lot of other stuff to be in the way. You've allowed a lot of other things to direct your affairs, to decide how you're gonna act. You, you've lived too much life here and not enough life here where the source of God's spirit wants to energize you and help you live freely. And I just want us to pray. It, it, it essentially just comes with an ask. It comes with an invitation. And it's no more difficult than that. So would you pray with me? Father, we come to you as we've 
studied the scripture a little bit here, we realize that we fall short. But we remind ourselves and we remind each other that that's the way it always is. We can't prove ourselves to you. We can't prove that we're spiritual or holy. We need an advocate. And we thank you for Jesus who came and took our place and showed us how to be crucified, how to give up his life. And we pray that you'd help us to know, to understand how to crucify our flesh, how to let others help us do that because it's hard, it's challenging. But I pray for a, a life that is resurrected in those moments when we decide we're going to yield to God's spirit, just like Jesus did. Yield to God's plan, yield to God's purpose, and just surrender and give in to it. And so here and now, in this place, we, each one of us, we ask you, God, fill us with your spirit. Cause your Holy Spirit to have greater influence in our hearts, in our minds, in our activities, in our attitudes. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We want your fruit to grow inside of us. We want to take the time that is required to allow that to happen. And we want help from our friends. So, Spirit of God, come and start that process here. Begin today. As we launch into this summer, as we launch into groups today, we choose to listen. We choose to yield. We choose to surrender to your Spirit and to the work of Christ in us. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.